everybody. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> Hope you're doing good. It's good to see everybody. Am I have, do I have the wrong microphone? Am I good? Okay. <laughs> well, we are glad that you are all here tonight. Are you ready to worship the Lord? <laughs> Amen. to worship the Lord too. And so if you guys would just stand up on your feet, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Start this service off right. I wanted to say this. I am so glad to be a part of a church who is doing something for the Lord. Getting out in the community, reaching people. We're all about winning souls. I'm it just going to different churches in different places. I think this church will not die as long as people are willing to do something. The day they quit is the day the church will start to die. So I'm proud of you. I am so proud to be a part of Lake City PH. Will you pray with me? Jesus, you are so good and you are so worthy. And we're so glad to be in your presence tonight. Come in here and have your way. Touch our pastor. Anoint him as he goes to speak and anoint our praise team. And let us just really worship you in spirit and in truth. You're why we're here. You're the one we love. And we just praise you and worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 about that day when Jesus is coming back for his people you don't look too excited out there I've seen some football games look a little more excited than going to heaven come on now somebody say hallelujah I'm excited tonight I'm waiting on him to come back hallelujah let's sing it again when we all get to
take a moment, if you will, tonight, shake somebody's hand and tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord tonight. Come on, get out across the aisle, shake somebody's hand. Hallelujah.
second verse again. But what's really coming up that we're super excited about is pastor appreciation. We truly, truly have the greatest pastor on planet Earth. And I'm not just saying that. (laughs) Amen. I'm not just saying it. He is the greatest of the greats, and we want to honor him and love him. So please be here May 7th. We're going to be having a special speaker, and we're going to have a meal after service. So come out and let's honor our pastor. On this Monday night, we're not going to be having prayer service. So if you're an intercessor and usually come out at, for, at 7 o'clock on, win, on Monday night, we're not going to be having that. You're still welcome to come pray. Miss Betty is just stuck and she can't get here until Wednesday, so we won't be able to have it with her. But you're still welcome to pray. I believe that's all the announcements that I was supposed to make. And so now if our ushers will please come. Oh, we do need to announce that we're having VBS, and we're needing some things for VBS, and that should be in your bulletin. If you would like to donate anything or just donate your time, please contact me or Miss Laura Boynton, and we'll get you in some places, and we'll use whatever we can that you could donate to us. Did you have another announcement? Oh, yes. Yeah. Senior Citizens is going to be April 25th, and so that'll be this week, I believe. Yes, this week. So... Please, if you are over the age. Oh, and women's retreat is also this Saturday. So if you don't want to go, if you also want to be a part over at the conference, we are having a women's retreat over there, and it's going to be Connie Brothers. She's incredible. 
It is at 10 o'clock in the morning. And so that's not too early. I can totally do that. It's not like those early prayer breakfasts that we have, which I love. But we can totally be there at 10 o'clock in the morning. And you do not want to miss her. She is an incredible speaker, singer. You're just going to really be blessed. So if you're a woman and you'd like to be a part of that, go over there. Bring your husband. Send him to the singing, which will be, well, that's going to be at 5. But still, he can get ready for it. So if you are ready to give your tithes and offering, let us pray. Jesus, right now, we just ask that you help us to be obedient. We thank you for blessing us like you do. We thank you for all that you do. Let us give back to you. Let us give fully and trusting that you are God, and we don't have to worry about a thing. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. you have um, gotten there, you can stand to your feet for the reading of God's Word. Joel chapter 3, verse 16. Joel chapter 3, verse 16. We um, had some, I don't know, have I told you that we have moved into the parsonage 
Um, I don't know if I've made that formal announcement. We have moved back into the parsonage, so if you see activity over there, that is uh, my family. We are back living there again, and uh, we have enjoyed it. My children love the parsonage. They love parsonage life, and um, they, they enjoy, I think they enjoy all this concrete to ride their bikes on. But we were getting, we had gotten some food from uh, Miss Sherry or Miss Rita, had uh, made some food the other day, and we were sitting there eating it, and, you know, we're getting things unpacked and getting things ready. And Amy had told Olivia, said, Olivia, don't mess with that plug, that outlet, or you'll get shocked. And so she's sitting there eating this food that Miss Rita had made, and she said to Amy, she said, Mama, is there a good kind of shocked and a bad kind of shocked? And um, she said, yeah, and she said, because I'm shocked at how good this icing is. <laughs> she loves chocolate. <laughs> oh, Joel chapter 3, verse 16. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. The Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the call to preach your word. Thank you, Lord, that with that call also came an anointing. And God, I would not try to dare stand before this congregation and preach without it. And even now, I can feel it. I can feel your power settling in on this congregation. And God, I know that you have a word for us tonight. I know, Lord God, that really the last couple of Sundays I've preached some, some pretty strong stuff. And God, I just felt a real urge for you to have me encourage the people tonight. And God, I pray that you will help me to do just that. I pray that the word that is spoken will be one of encouragement and empowerment and expectancy and we ask this in Jesus' name, and the church said, amen and amen. As Joel, that great prophet of the end time, who also is really kind of maybe the first real Pentecostal prophet, um, who made the wonderful prophecies of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and how the Spirit would come on, on all flesh. And um, he stands here in the third chapter, and he starts in verse 14, and he says, Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And he talks about how that the Lord would utter his voice and how the heavens and the earth would shake. And then he makes this powerful statement in saying, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. But the Lord will be the hope of his people. What he is saying is, is there are some very um, horrible times that are coming down. There are some very horrible things that are coming down the pipeline. There are some very difficult situations. In fact, it is going to be unlike any other time. But here's the news for you. The Lord will be the hope of his people. No matter what happens, the Lord will be the hope of his people. No matter what disaster, catastrophe comes, the Lord will be the hope of his people. Have you found him to be your hope? Let me see your hand. Have you found him to be dependable? Have you found him to be always there, ever present, always there whenever you need him? Um, the word hope is defined in the dictionary as simply saying a desire with expectation of obtainment, to expect with confidence, and the Lord is that hope. I want to talk to you tonight about three different areas that the Lord is our hope. Number one, Jesus is our eternal hope. Number two, Jesus is our earthly hope. And number three, Jesus is our ever-present hope in time of trouble. I would tell you that Jesus really is the only true hope there is. A lot of people put their hope in a politician. A lot of people put their hope in a job. Some even put their hope in a pastor. Some put their hope in a church. But the fact of the matter is, is the only real hope any of us have is in Jesus Christ. He is the only true hope there is. Everything else is sinking sand. 
Everything else is going to fall. Everything else is going to collapse. Governments will collapse, governments will rise, and governments will fall. But the one thing we have, the one certainty we have, is that Jesus Christ has established a church, and he said the very gates of hell would not prevail against it. There is nothing else in the entirety of the world that has this guarantee. The markets rise and the markets fall. If you have money in the market, one day you may be a millionaire, and the next day you may be broke. One day you may make 40% and the next day you may lose 40%. There, there is just nothing stable about the markets. But there is one stable thing and his name is Jesus. And if you'll put your hope and your trust in him, you can always be confident that he is going to see you through. If I were to ask you tonight, what is the greatest hope with expectation a child of God has? What would you say it is? What is the greatest hope a child of God has? The hope of glory, of heaven. That's right, salvation. The hope of glory. The fact that this world is not the end, amen? This world is not the end. This is just a, a pause in eternity, literally. It literally is just a pause in eternity. Imagine that eternity is the largest novel that has ever been written with more words than has ever been recorded. Your life in the midst of eternity is but a comma. It's just a pause in the midst of eternity. And this is where I've come to tell you the greatest hope we have is the hope of knowing this world is not it. You know, even the Apostle Paul made a statement kind of like this. He said, if I thought all I had was hope in this life, I'd be of all men most miserable. This is not my only hope. This is not my final destination. I'm not going to live here for a few years and then die and go into darkness. No, there is a such thing called the resurrection. Jesus got up to show us we're going to get up. And because we put our faith and our trust and our hope in Jesus, one day we're going to get up out of the ground. We're going to be resurrected, but we're not just going to walk around the earth. No, we're going to rise to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And he said, comfort one another with these words. Go with me to John's Gospel, the 14th chapter. Heaven, heaven, man, it's unexplainable. In fact, the Bible says something like this. It says, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it even entered into the imagination of men what it will be like. But Jesus, through his earthly body, did his best to give some some understanding of what this place called heaven would be. In John 14 and 1, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Now, I know that other translations outside of the authorized version will say that many dwelling places, but I've been in some places. I've been in some dwelling places. I, I like to stick with the original authorized version on this one. In my Father's house are many mansions. Amen. Mansions galore, mansions untold, mansions uncomparable to anything in this earth. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I want to show you tonight the components of this heavenly hope. First of all, this is the first component of our heavenly hope. Number one, there is no reason to be troubled. There is no reason to be troubled. But you know, it seems like for me, the, the longer I live, the longer I live, the more troubling death is. The longer I live, it seems like it's more troubling to me, to, to the thought of leaving my family, of leaving this world, of leaving this earth. My great-grandmother died at the age of 96, and I can still remember being around her bedside and, and all the family there. She was the, really the first person in my family I can ever remember passing away. And, and my grandmother had accepted the Lord. To be honest with you, she probably wasn't the best Christian in the world. She was very um, holiness. She had long hair that had never been cut. She didn't wear pants. She didn't wear makeup. She didn't wear jewelry. But she only went to church about once every um, five weeks. 
and, um, and she was probably not the greatest Christian world. Now that I look back on it, I can kind of understand why she was a little iffy um, on her salvation. I Sometimes, you know, as a child, I thought she was just the stalwart warrior of, of, of godliness, but when I look back on it now, I wonder just how close to the Lord she really was. But the fact is, is that she was always troubled about the thought of dying. And I can remember one day standing around her bed, and I was a little bitty boy at that time, and I remember it wasn't going to be long, and, and I was standing there, and we were praying, and I said to her, I said, Grandma, I said, aren't you so excited about going to heaven? Aren't you so excited about living in heaven? Aren't you so excited about seeing Jesus? And she had had a child that had passed away. In fact, she had two children that had passed away. And I said, just think when you get there, you're going to get to see your children. You know what she said? Get these kids out of this room. She was troubled. She was troubled. Now, I believe she made it by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I do believe that she made it in. But I want to tell you something, Christian, you shouldn't be troubled about eternity. You shouldn't be troubled. And if you are troubled, that's an attack of the devil on your life. You should not be troubled about eternity. This world, listen, one day I'm going to close my eyes in this world and I'm going to open my eyes in another world. Amen. Hallelujah. One day this world, it's just going to be a, I'm going to, I think it's going to be kind of like it was with Enoch. Remember the Bible says, and Enoch was not. I think, it, I think a, a conversation kind of took place like this. Enoch and God were walking to, along the um, road one day, and the Bible says that, that Enoch walked with God. It's just an amazing thing to think about. But Enoch is with God, and God says to Enoch, he says, Enoch, we're a whole lot closer to my house than we are yours. Let's just go on to my house. See, that's the way it ought to be for a Christian. The older we get, the longer we serve God, the more we're in the presence of God, the more we're in the Word of God. One day the Lord says to us that whatever undisclosed age it may be, it might be 80, it might be 90, it might be 100, but at some point he says, you know, we're a whole lot closer to my house than we are yours. Let's just go on to my house. Amen. Don't, don't you know that if you're a child of God, you don't have to live with a troubled spirit about eternity. Listen, the worst the, worst the devil could do to you is kill you. <laughs> the very worst that could happen to you is that you die. And if you're saved and born again and you know Jesus, you're going to make it to heaven. And you know, my, my heart is, God, let us recapture that childlike faith. I remember when we started telling our children about heaven and hell and, and explaining to them about heaven. Of course, we told them a little more about heaven than we have hell. We, we, we're, we're, we're finally beginning to have to tell them some things about hell. But, but for a long time, we just mainly talked about heaven. And, you know, they, they would say, we would say to them, don't run out in the road. If you run out in the road, you'll get hit by a car. And they'd say, well, we'll just go to heaven. <laughs> you, you know, that, that's the kind of attitude, though, that we really ought to possess. This world is just a vapor. Here today and gone tomorrow. And if I fall off of it today, I'm going to a much better place. And Jesus would say to us, let not your heart be troubled. Then he said this, it is a place of great splendor. Listen, heaven is better than earth. Heaven is better than earth on its greatest day. Heaven is better than the earth than, than on the day that you wake up and you're in Hawaii and you don't have a pain in your body and there's the blue seas out there and the beautiful waterfalls. I've never been there, but, you know, I just have heard people talk about Hawaii. Well, let, let's just get here to home. Heaven's better than Myrtle Beach. On the best day Myrtle Beach has, heaven is better than Myrtle Beach. On the day you have no pains in your body, is there anybody who has pains in their body? Is there anybody who ever has a good day where you're not hurting? <laughs> so the older you get, the less of those there are. But the fact of the matter is, is you know of some good days. Heaven's better than that. Heaven's better than the mountains. Heaven's better than your favorite vacation destination. We, we let our baby, can't believe this, we let our baby leave today, three years old. We let her go off with, with her grandmother, with Tanya, and they're going to Greenville to see Tanya's mom. In fact, they're there now. And um, she's so excited. She's so happy about it. 
And she told my mother yesterday on the telephone, she said, I'm going on holiday. I'm going on holiday with Nani. Peppa Pig, that's all I know. That's the only place she could have picked it up, going on holiday with Nani. But, but the fact is, is no matter where you go on holiday, and no matter what destination you go to, there is no place on this earth that compares to heaven. That's why he said, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It's not entered in the heart of man of what that place is going to be like. Listen, if it's better than earth, it's a whole lot better than hell. You, you see, this, this is the way I believe. Now, you may believe different ways, and that's okay. You believe whatever way you want to. If you want to be wrong, believe whatever way you want to. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, but, but this is the way I really do believe. I believe that everything we get on this earth, we get by grace, except for financial blessings that comes through sowing and reaping. But if you get healed, you get healed because somebody believed God and you got healed. I have known rank sinners that have gotten healed, and I've known godly people who have died. And so I believe that what we get on this earth, we get by grace, but... I believe that everything I do on this earth, I'm laying up treasure in heaven. Laying up those treasures in that home above. Trusting fully, trusting in my Savior's love. Doing what I can for heaven's holy dove. I'm getting ready to leave this world. You see, everything, everything we do on this earth, I believe I'm laying up treasure in heaven. And I believe that when I get there, there's going to be a rewards banquet at some point in some time. And all the things I did for God. Because what didn't Jesus say? That none of you have done anything on this earth that I'll not pay you back. And then heaven on top of that. And so I don't think everybody's going to have the same mansion. I don't know that everybody's going to live in the same neighborhood. I believe there's going to be some people. My granddaddy will get to heaven. He was 87 years old. And he never served God, to my knowledge, a single day in his life. But he, but he accepted the Lord. He had a godly wife. He had godly family, and we prayed him through, and he got to heaven. I believe he's in heaven by the grace of Jesus Christ. But I don't think he's going to have the same rewards that my grandmother has. I don't believe he'll have the same rewards that Grandma had because Grandma, Grandma devoted 50 years of, tenac of tenacious living to the Lord. I don't believe he'll have the same rewards that she had. And so when I get to heaven, I'm not going to have the same rewards as the person that just made it in by the skin of their teeth. But listen... Don't let that detour you from going. <laughs> because heaven's worst trailer park is better than hell's best neighborhood. Don't let anything detour you from going. Heaven on its worst day, and they don't have a bad day there, but if they did, on its worst day is better than the earth on its best day. And it's certainly better than hell. So you want to go there. Amen? Amen. You want to go there. And this isn't really part of my message tonight. You want to go there, and you want to take as much treasure with you as you can. You want to put as much seed in the ground. You want to put as much seed in the earth. You want to put as much labor in the kingdom as you can. Because when you get there, there's not one thing you've done here that will not be accounted for there. And God keeps very, very good records. Amen. So it's a place of spender. He says, it is as sure as your faith is in God. That's what he said. He said, if you believe in God, believe also in me. As sure as your faith is in God, your faith is in that place called heaven, that eternal, that eternal home. If I believe there is a God, I have to believe there is a heaven. Amen. As sure as there is a God, there is a place called heaven. Jesus is preparing it as we speak. He said, he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. Now, think about this. He made the sun, the moon, the stars. He made everything in six days. And he rested on the seventh. Everything as we see it, as we know it, he made it. He made it. The earth in all of its splendor, he made it. He made it in six days. Days. Somebody said, well, do you believe those were six? I believe they were six physical days. I believe he could have made it in an instant. But he chose the six-day period of time to show us that we are to work and rest 
work, and rest. See, he, he, everything God does, he does deliberately. So, so he showed us that we are to work and rest, work and rest. But Jesus said this. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, if he could create everything that, that the earth has, all the beauty of the earth, if he could do it in six days, imagine what heaven will be like. And then you may say, well, preacher, you mean you really think he's been working on heaven for 2,000 years? I do. And the reason I believe he's been working on it for 2,000 years is because you and I keep sending him building material. Every time we're obedient to the heavenly dove, every time that we are working, every time that we are laboring in the kingdom, we are sending him material, and he is taking that material, and he is making heaven more, more magnificent and the splendor of heaven. And so he is constantly in building mode. He's been preparing He's preparing a place. That tells me it's not already prepared. He's, do you understand what I'm saying? He is in the preparing mode even tonight. He's preparing that place for us. And then he says he's coming back to us. And where he is, there we will be also. So he is your heavenly hope. If your faith and your trust is in Jesus, look at me, my friend, and listen to me. When you die, you will go to heaven and not hell. If you have put your full cope and confidence and faith in Jesus, if you have surrendered your life to him through faith, then when you die, you will go to heaven and not hell. And oh, it's wonderful. But he is our heavenly hope. We'll get to heaven by grace. We'll get to there by grace. But he is our heavenly hope. Let me tell you this. He is not only our heavenly hope. He is also right now our earthly hope. He is our hope against all physical catastrophes, against all economic collapses, against all political unrest. He is our hope. People of God, we don't have to worry like others worry. You hear what I'm telling you? We don't have to worry like others worry. We don't have to fret like others fret. That, that's hard. You know, one of the hardest things that God ever asked us to do, when, when, when we think about rules, you know, oftentimes we think about not drinking and not smoking and not playing certain, you know, games and not involved in certain activities. The hardest thing we've ever been asked to do was he told us, first of all, to forgive everybody, even while they're doing you wrong. Talk about tough. But then he told us something else that's almost equally that difficult. He told us not to worry. He told us not to be troubled. There's a number of times he tells us, do not be troubled, do not worry, be anxious for nothing. He told us not to worry. He told us not to be anxious about eternity, but he also is saying, don't even be worried while you're on the earth. Don't, even be, don't be worried about anything that you face. Just don't worry. And listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 90, 91 and 1. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I believe he's talking about saved people right there, don't you? I think he's talking about people who dwell in the Spirit. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth. <laughs> what is his truth? <laughs> his word. Sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flieth by day, nor of the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor of the destruction that wasteth at noonday. And then I love verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. 
Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Let's go back to what he said in Joel. In Joel 3 and 14 when he said, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Somebody said that that's not a day that we'll be deciding about God, but it's a day that God will be deciding about us. You see, right now, Jesus Christ is our Savior, and he has, he has already said, anybody that wants me can come to me. Anybody that wants to accept me can come to me. No matter how wretched you are, no matter how full of sin you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what commandments you've broken, if you'll come to me, I'll accept you, and I'll accept you as if you had never sinned. I will make you spotless. I will make you white as snow. I will clean you up and I will justify you just as if you never sinned. This is the hour. This is the day of the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But when the writer is talking in Joel 3 and 14, he is not talking about today. He is talking about a future tense time. And in that time, God is the one that's making the choosing. Man will not be choosing about God. God will be choosing about man. Somebody told me a story some years ago of a little boy that was out skating on a frozen lake. And the ice broke and the little boy fell underneath the ice. A man was riding down the road and he saw this scene and he pulled over to the side and he ran out to where the boy was and he scooted across the ice to his own peril and the possibility of his own death. He reached his hand down into the icy waters. He grabbed the little boy by the hair of the head and pulled the little boy up from out of the icy waters. He drug the little boy's body to the shore where he began to do um, CPR and he revived the little boy. He took his coat off and he wrapped his body around the little boy's body until the little boy's body warmed up and he saved the little boy's life. More than 20 something years had gone by and the little boy grew up and as a man, he had made some very bad and wrong decisions. And he had knocked over a liquor store. And he had taken a gun and he shot the owner of the store. And now this young man is standing before a judge. He comes in and he sits in the courtroom and he looks and there is the judge. And lo and behold, it was that man that pulled him out of the ice. And all the evidence is laid before them. And the judge looked at him and said, I sentence you to death. And the young man looked at him and said, Sir, don't you know who I am? When I was just a little boy, you risked your own life and pulled me out of an icy lake. You warmed my body. You breathed air back into my lungs. I would have died that day if you had not saved me. And the judge looked at him and said, young man, I know exactly who you are. On that day, I was your savior. But today, I am your judge. 2,000 years ago, mankind was sinking beneath the icy waters of sin. And God himself crawled out onto the ice. And in his own peril, he reached down and pulled mankind up. And 2,000 years later, anybody at all who wants his love and his protection and his forgiveness and his salvation, anyone at all that wants it, all they have to do is call on his name. But there is coming a day that he will not be our savior. He will be our judge. 
multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Everybody has a choice at this point in time. Do you want him to be your savior? Because he will be your savior. But there's coming a day that he'll be your judge. And on that day, you'll be judged for all the foul things you've ever done. But if you'll accept him as your savior now, he will clean the slate And when you stand before him, he will say, I've already made my decision about you. I've already made my decision about you. But Lord, you don't know what they've done. The devil, the accuser of the brethren will say, but you don't know what they've done. He said, I've already made my decision about them. And as I look at the slate, I see nothing but clean. Not one single infraction, not one single sin, nothing they've ever done, nothing at all. They're as pure as the blood of Jesus. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall withdraw its shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice from out of Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people. And the strength of the children of Israel. Do you understand that this world will be judged? America will be judged. I don't even know what the count is. Does anybody know what the count is? How many tens of millions of babies that have been slaughtered in this country at this point? Is it 60 million, 70 million? I mean, an ocean of blood runs from the innocence of unborn children. This country will be judged. Hear me. It will be judged. The Supreme Court and those that made the decision that said that God's word was invalid and no longer culturally relevant, they will be judged. Every politician that put their name to it will be judged. Every person that put their support in it will be judged. And America as a whole will be judged. But I've come by to tell you tonight that if you'll make your place in the shadow of the Almighty, if you'll make him your dwelling place, a thousand will fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand. But it shall not come nigh you. Because he is our earthly hope. He's not only my heavenly hope. If that was all he was, that would be good enough. If that was everything he was, that would be good enough. That would be worth serving him. If I were to die, if I had to live the next 70 years in misery, or if I lived 70 years on this life in misery, and died and met Jesus in eternity, every day of this 70 years would have been worth it. If he had piled rules and rules and regulations on top of me that were basically unbreathable, and he said, you can't, you can't enjoy anything in life like some people think, and I made it to heaven, it'd be worth it. It'd be worth it. If he required me, as the Muslims, God requires of them, to strap bombs on me and fly myself into a building, he wouldn't be the God of that Bible, but if that's what he required, it would be worth it. To avoid hell would be worth it. But what I'm telling you is this. We serve a God so loving and so merciful that he has not required any of that out of us. He has required only of us to love him. And in loving him, he loads us with benefits. How often? Daily. (laughs) Daily he loadeth me with benefits. He says all of this will happen with your eyes. You Watch CNN and you'll see it happen. 
Watch Fox News and you'll see it happen. Watch NBC and you'll see it happen. With your eyes you shall behold it, but it shall not come nigh thee. He is our earthly hope. He is our heavenly hope. He's our eternal hope. And I know somebody, somebody watching tonight, maybe by the internet, or maybe somebody here, you would say, preacher, I know he's my heavenly hope. I know he's my eternal hope. And I know he's the general hope of all the world. But preacher, I'm going through some hard things right now. I'm going through some devastating things right now. I've gotten a report from the doctor that I didn't want. My wife or my husband have walked out on me. My children are on drugs and dying, and it looks like we're going to lose everything we own. Preacher, I, I understand he's my eternal hope, and I understand he's our earthly hope, but I have some problems right now, and I want to tell you he's also your ever-present hope. He is your ever-present hope. That means he's your hope through what you're going through. He's not just the hope of the world, and he's not just the hope of glory, but he is the hope of right now, of your ever-present situation. Whatever you're going through, he right now is currently your hope. He wants to walk into that situation and do what only he can do and perform what only he can perform. That's who he is. That's who he is. Let me close with this story. When I say that, that means nothing because it's a long story. <laughs> that was pretty funny. John the Baptist is outside of Jesus, in my opinion, the most unique character in the Bible for a number of reasons. He is the last prophet of the Old Testament, and he is the first prophet of the New Testament. He literally straddles two testamental periods. He is filled with the Holy Ghost, yet while in his mother's womb, he is the first man to ever preach Pentecost. He has allowed the opportunity to conduct the baptismal service of Jesus. He stood that day when the triunity of God showed up in its fullness in a way it had never done in all of human history when the voice from heaven declared, Behold, this is my beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit descended and lighted on him as a dove. His whole reason for being, his whole purpose for existence was to declare that Jesus Christ was coming. He is possibly the most unique person to ever live. But he finds himself in a jail awaiting his own death. And not just any death, but to be beheaded. What was his crime? His only crime is that he was a holiness preacher. When I was preaching Lent last year, I was talking with Shane Patrick, my good friend who pastors First Baptist Church, and Sam Marson Gill, my other good friend that pastors First Methodist Church here. And Sam had preached about Ezekiel and the dry bones. And I said to Sam that day, I said, Sam, I said, you preached a Pentecostal message. There's not a Pentecostal preacher in the world worth his sweat that hadn't preached from the valley of the dead dry bones. And Shane Patrick said, well, Sam, I guess we found out that Ezekiel was a Pentecostal. And I quickly said to Shane, I said, oh, I believe every writer in the New Testament and was Pentecostal. And Shane said, wait, John the Baptist, you got to give us him. I said, oh, no. He was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. 
and he was the first man that ever said, you shall be baptized in the Holy Ghost and with fire. So he was Pentecostal to the core. But he found himself in a prison waiting to be beheaded. One commentator said if he had wrote this story, he would have left it out of the Bible. Because there is nothing more degrading than for one of your chief components, one of your chief cabinet members to lose confidence in you. But yet he had. He lost confidence in Jesus. His only crime was he preached holiness and he dared to stick his his finger in the face of authority and tell him what he was doing was sin. And because of that, he was thrown into a prison and he was awaiting his own death because of a very evil and wicked woman. And while he's in that prison, he says to his disciples, to his interns, he said, would you please go ask Jesus, is he the one or should we look for another? Is he the one, or should we look for another? I submit to you that if there was anybody that has ever been born to woman that knew that Jesus Christ was who he said he was and is, was John the Baptist. You cannot be Holy Ghost baptized without a revelation of Jesus. His whole inception, everything was centered around the birth of Jesus Christ. He had spent his whole life declaring that there was one coming. He had spent his whole life being told that who you see the Spirit descending on and remaining on, he observed that with his own eyes. But yet he finds himself in a place so low, so down, so deep, And he says, is he the one? Or should we look for another? Say, what are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you that the man who Jesus said, there has never been any born among women greater than him found himself in a place where he questioned the identity and the person of Jesus. And how could I possibly stand before you and tell you that I'm better than John the Baptist? Because I'm not. And if you have never found yourself in a place where you have not seriously questioned your faith, then you probably have never really been through anything. And so John is in this place where he is saying, I want to hope beyond hope. I want to believe beyond belief. But I'm not sure anymore. And so he says to his disciples, he said, go ask Jesus. Are you the one or should we look for another? Are you the one or should we look for another? It was insulting. The question was insulting. How insulting for John to ask this question to Jesus. I'm I'm telling you, I don't know that I could have handled it when he got to where Jesus was and they said, Jesus, John wants to know, are you really the Son of God? Are you really the promised Messiah? Are you really who you said you were? How Jesus kept from turning around and saying, you go tell that ingrate. He knows exactly who I am. How dare he question me? But he turns around and he says, go tell John. The blind leave me seeing. And the lame leave me walking. And the deaf leave me hearing. And the dumb leave me talking. And the lepers leave me cleansed. And I don't even go to a funeral where I leave a dead body. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) 
by the way, tell my cousin, tell my brother, tell John, blessed is he, whoever is not offended because of me. Now, if you're not careful, you'll get caught up in that roll call, and like me, you'll want to shout. But you'll miss what Jesus was saying. This is what Jesus was saying. Tell John that... (laughs) Tell John that his current situation has not changed who I am. Tell John that what he's going through has not diminished my power or my authority. Tell John I am God, I'm still God, and I always will be God. And this is what I've come to tell you tonight. Those that are here and those watching by the internet, by television, or however you're viewing this, I've come to tell you tonight that no matter what you're going through, no matter how hard you're fighting, no matter how sick you are, no matter how broke you are, no matter how poor you are, no matter how discouraged you are, there is this current situation has not changed who he is. He's still God and he's still in control. I have a hope that's steadfast and sure. I have an anchor that will endure. Yes, my anchor holds beyond the grave. For Jesus our Lord, the great resurrection is mighty to save to all those who weep. The Lord draweth nigh, he too is weeping, he hears your heart cry, but in Jesus our Lord, the soul never dies, for he is the resurrection of life, our loved one shall rise. Do you hear me? Do you understand he's your hope? He's your hope right now. He's your hope in eternity. But he's currently your ever-present hope. Stand to your feet. When I was 14 years old, I lost, at that time, the single most precious person in my life. My mother's mother was as selfless and as godly as any human being I've ever known. And at the age of 70, she was ravaged with cancer and used as a guinea pig and died one of the most horrible, horrific deaths of anybody I've ever known. She was a shell of a person. They burned her brain with chemotherapy. I mean burned her brain. She had none of the the functions that she one time had. She looked horrible. but I loved her. She died at my mom and dad's home when I was 14 years old. I walked by her bed on a Monday afternoon. 
And I said to her, Grandma, what are you doing? I really was just kind of making small talk. She most of the time didn't know who she was or who anybody was. She was in so much pain. But she looked at me and she said, I'm just waiting on you. Her lungs filled with fluid and later on that afternoon, that body quit breathing. But the last word she said, I'm just waiting on you. She's laying in a cemetery in northwest Florida, right outside a whiting field. Oh, it's a common grave. It's not a fancy tombstone. There's no accolades that could be laid there. She had never served in the military. She had never led anything or headed up anything outside of a Sunday school class. But one day, and I feel the expectancy even now, that one day, Jesus is going to step out on the clouds. He's going to place a trumpet to his mouth. And it's going to sound so loud that it's going to wake the dead. And I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know the medical science or spirituality. I don't know how it's going to happen. But that body that has been laying there now for 30 years that was in horrid shape when it was put there that I'm sure is nothing but dust and bone. Somehow when that trumpet sounds, all of that will reconfigure in a glorified state And what was corruptible shall be made incorruptible. <laughs> and that little layer of concrete is going to bust open. And that casket is going to fly open. And that body is going to rise from out of that grave. And just about the time it hits the treetops, I too will hear that sound. Sound It'll happen in a twinkling of an eye. They tell me that's half the time it takes to blink. In the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. And we shall rise to meet him in the air. I hope I can remember to say it. I'll be so excited. But I hope I can take her by the hand and say, you're not waiting on me no more. <laughs> what a day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus, I shall see. I have a hope. I have a hope beyond the grave. I want to encourage you tonight. He is your eternal hope. He is your earthly hope. And He is your ever-present hope. How many of you have loved ones on the other side? How many of you know they're getting up out of the grave? We're going to meet them in the air. Oh, if you had the microphone, you could tell me about a sainted mother you had or a sainted grandmother. You could tell me about your, your loved one. If you had the microphone, you could, you could tell it just like I told it about yours. Every one of us have a story. And yours is just as touching as mine. 
we're going to meet them. Cole, we're going to meet them. This is not just a story. This is not just a fable. This is not just a fairy tale. This is reality. We're going to meet them. We're going to meet them. He is our hope. Our ever-present hope. Let's just come gather around the altar tonight. Everyone that would, would you just come? Let's just gather around the altar tonight. Let's sing it one more time. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand, and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Oh, what a day that will be, when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you tonight that you are our hope. You are our eternal hope. You are our earthly hope. And you are our ever-present hope right now, in this hour, and in this moment. You are our hope. And Lord, if there's somebody tonight that has lost confidence in you, if there's somebody tonight that their, the weight of their life is crushing them. The weight of their life is crumbling in around them. And they've lost confidence. Lord, would you restore their hope tonight? Would you let them know the blind are still seeing? The deaf are still hearing? The lame are still walking? The dumb are still talking? The lepers are still being cleansed and the dead are still being raised. You're still God. And our situation has not changed, not one bit, your power and your authority. God, restore their hope in you tonight. Restore their confidence in you tonight. And I ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, and amen, and amen. Hallelujah. It's been a good day in the Lord, hasn't it? Would you just turn around and hug somebody? Somebody might need prayer. Would you pray for them while they're standing right there? But would you just turn around and hug somebody? and? Let them know you love them and let them know Jesus loves them. Let them know everything's going to be okay because of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Senior citizens, come Tuesday night. 
Everybody else, please come Wednesday. Man, we're having some great Wednesday night services. Come and be with us Wednesday. God bless you. You are just